Book. Everybody ready? First of all, <clears throat> namaskar to all. Om Akhanda Mandala Karam Vyaptam Yen Characharam Tatpadam Darshidam Yen Tasmai Shri Guruye Namaha Ajnana Timirandasya Jnananjanam Shalakaya Chakshur Minitam Yen Tasmai Shri Guruye Namaha Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Sakshat Parabrahm Tasmai Shri Guruye Namaha Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha um, we're in Hyderabad. Telugu la mat lade da. Ah, there are many people here. I, I'm talking in English. Don't worry. Don't tell me. Um, so, it's a two and a half day retreat almost. Now, usually we have satsangs for a couple of one day, one and a half days, and then we have Kriya. Here, Nandini and Sridhar and our good group of friends have changed it topsy-turvy. Urdhomu ulamatha shakam and so now we have tomorrow Kriya. <laughs> and so today, I need to give you a briefing on what Kriya is all about tomorrow. Um, because it's not merely an exercise where you breathe in and breathe out. You need to know why you do Kriya. What is the... Uh, is it a shortcut or... It's not. But you, you need to know. So, um, I will talk a little bit about Kriya. And since we are going to have a short meditation after this, um, I will also generally give you some kind of... I know many of you must be meditating or we wouldn't be here. So, But still, for those who think they need a little bit of uh, help, I will explain that to you a little bit. And then uh, we will... You came alone, huh? Or about Ladies have all dropped over here. Yeah. So, not bad, good. So, <laughs> so what we are going to do now is first to, I will have a little satsang explaining some things which are in some way related to Kriya tomorrow. And then tomorrow we'll have a Kriya session. After that you'll clear your doubts and then we'll go on to the general satsang. This is how it is become now. <laughs> Uh, so, a few basic things which we need to know. One, that we, human beings, human beings, B-E-A-N-S, we human beings, <laughs> have been and always are searching for happiness. That's basic, whether you're interested in meditation or spiritual matters or not. Or whether you're only interested in corporate life, TED Talks and so on. You're only looking for happiness, right? Everybody's searching for happiness of some kind. Some people think happiness is like eating a little bit of ice cream, enjoying yourself uh, and so on. That's one idea about happiness. The other is Many people think peace is important. Peace, calmness, tranquility. Without that, happiness is just a short jump up and a small jump down. So, we are looking at this. <clears throat> this search for happiness takes us to many things. You are single and you think you will become happy if you get married. Now you have to ask the married guys. Um, then 
you're married and you think you'll be happy if you're single. We, uh, nothing wrong with that, it's normal. I mean. Then uh, I have uh, some money and I think if I have some more then I would become happier. Okay, all legitimate, I'm not blaming anyone. Um, I'm driving a little Suzuki. I think when I, I've reached the height of my happiness when I'm driving a Mercedes. Hmm? Live alone a Bentley or whatever. I think I'm going to die. Everybody is going to die. Not bad news, good news sometimes. We are all going to die. In Australia, this every day morning they say it's good to die. <laughs> so we, you look at anybody's history. Some are born poor, and they make a lot of money, and then and so on and so on. Then you keep asking. Then, then, uh, then he died. If somebody was very rich, he lost everything. He became a pauper. You keep asking and then, well, then he died. Or she, it doesn't matter. Normal. Happens. Keeps on happening. So, we also have this constant fear that what we have is going to go. The fear of death is not so much the fear of the unknown, the fear that we cannot take all the things that we think are dear to us with us when we go. If somebody can guarantee that when you die, we can take all your things, what you love and everything with you, who is afraid of death? You can't, that's the whole problem. Well, you can take your mind. There's nothing else that, even mind, the, the People who don't believe in beyond the, this life say that you can't even take your mind, it's all over, finished. I don't believe that, but I'm just saying. So there's an end to every desire, to everything. The great uh, weaver saint Banaras, Kabir Das, said, gave a beautiful example of the musk deer. You can hear me at the end? Okay. Because some, I saw some faces at the end are completely blank. And I was thinking either they can't hear or they are in samadhi. So, one of these. So, <laughs> so you know the Kasturi uh, Mriga, as it's called in India, musk deer is a small variety of deer that still thrives in the Himalayas. And in a certain season, not always. It has a little kind of a bag under its belly, gland. A certain season, musk builds up in the little bag, pouch. You know how beautiful musk is. You might have had some musk spray. You know. So when this happens, this beautiful fragrance of the musk in the air of the Kasturi. India we call it Kasturi. The poor deer feels the fragrance but doesn't know the source. He thinks that it's probably coming from somewhere in the forest. He searches for it everywhere, pokes his snout into the thorny bushes, gets bleeding but still doesn't realize that this fragrance is coming from its own belly, belly button. Kabir Das said, that is the only problem with us. There are no other problems. That we look for happiness is legitimate, is built into the brain, to the system, to look for happiness. But we think that it can be found outside by gathering things. 
while the Upanishad says, Tena tyak tena bhanjita, let go and rejoice. And this happiness that we seek in all things in the world. Well, when you are hungry, you have to eat food, that's a different matter. This constant build up of wanting is actually the search is quite legitimate because the brain is built to search for happiness. The direction is a little wrong. We could turn the direction and look within. In Vedanta it's called the Nivrti Marga as opposed to the Pravrti Marga. If we can turn in and look, you'll find the treasure right here inside. Now, this is the journey to find the treasure within. Now, to find the treasure within, depending on a person's tradition, background, past words, I believe in past words. Uh, you don't have to believe it, but I do. I can't put it in a test tube and show you what I do. But depending on a person's past in this life, past in the last lives, character, hormonal balance, various factors, the approach to this happiness, even internally, to find the source, may be different. Because we have come from different backgrounds. We have some common factors, like we all seek happiness. We all eat, we drink, we get angry, we are jealous sometimes. I don't know why people are jealous, this I don't understand. Because it's nothing to do with me. Somebody is happy and I'm feeling terrible. It's one of the most strangest emotions. <laughs> but we have it. I don't think everybody has it. So, depending upon our background and our past and various factors, we think differently, we have different ideas about things. Therefore, since the treasure that we seek is infinite, there must be many ways to get there. Well, if there are not many ways to get there, then it cannot be infinite, it be finite. Right? You know the story of the elephant and the blind man? Some of our friends who have known me for many years have heard it a number of times. You can go out and come back if you want. <laughs> <laughs> now, he, this is a story actually from ancient Jain sources. The Jains have a beautiful philosophy called Anekayata Dwad. That means one thing may be seen differently by different people. It's a very ancient philosophy. And there's but something interesting that the Jains are atheists. They don't believe in a creator. And yet, they are one of the most religious people that you can find on earth. I'm not a Jain, okay? I'm not preaching Jain. So from Jain sources comes this beautiful story of the elephant and the three blind men who went to find, figure out what an elephant is. Later on, it was adapted beautifully by a great Sufi teacher in Turkey called Jalaluddin Rumi, who founded the Order of the Whirling Dervishes. Well, he clearly said that this whirling is not meant for everybody. <laughs> Lest everybody starts whirling. Anyway, so this story kind of illustrates that there must be many ways to get there. There can't be one single way. There's one person I know who is a good friend of mine, passed away, no more physically here, older, much older than me, who said there is no way to truth. Forget that for the time being. He said there's no path to truth. Which means something else which we'll discuss. If there's no path to truth, why am I seeking the truth? I mean, anyway. So, that's very interesting because some years ago I had a, uh, if I lose my thread, please remind me where I was. I would also know you're not sleeping, so. Um, 
maybe some years ago, I met uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Delhi. Um, I was going on a walk from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, which was which took us one year and four months walking. It was good for everybody's health, I assure you. And uh, so I, before that, I was meeting a couple of people to take blessings or to tell them that, look, I'm going to do this. So I met him in Delhi in the Taj. So I was taken to his room. I was very uh, touched by his humility because he was, he needn't have done that. He has bad knees and so on. He was standing at the door of the room with his assistant and then he said, come in. So I said, do you know, I have to take off my shoes. He said, why? I'm wearing shoes. Come in. <laughs> anyway, I said, I, it's traditional in India to take off your shoes. So I took off my shoes and went inside. So we had a nice chat. He was telling me many things. So I was trying to tell him that I think the teachings of the, especially the principal Upanishads, the eleven principal Upanishads, uh, ultimately are not so different from this Shunyavada of the Buddhists. Not so different, a little bit. So I said, in the Upanishad, Kena Upanishad says, Yat Manasana Manyute, that which even the mind cannot conceive, that is the Supreme Truth. He said something very nice. He said, even if the mind cannot find it, which means we cannot find it, so what does it matter to me if there is a reality or not? So I said, I think what it means is the ordinary mind cannot understand it. He said, yeah, you see that? You have to say that again and again. The ordinary mind cannot understand it. Which means an extraordinary mind can understand it. Which means we can develop the mind to an extent where it is no longer ordinary. And then it can understand the truth. He said, one needs to clarify this because otherwise people think if the mind can, then it has nothing to do with me. A way of agnostic way of life. I have nothing to do. Maybe there is a divinity. Who cares? I have nothing to do with it. So ordinary mind cannot touch it. Well, that's a different matter. Um, what I was trying to say that uh, what did I say? <laughs> so, yes, yes. So, hmm. I'm very careful nowadays. I have a very good friend who lives in the United States. Every time I do this, because he sees all the YouTubes, he's a doctor. And then the other day, he sent me a long list of B12, B6, B4. <laughs> all the things I need to take. Because he said, I think you're losing your thread while you're talking. So you need to... Anyway. Um, so. But this is the way I think, you know, I, I, I don't think like this. I go like this. Well, there's a new word for it. It's called fuzzy logic. <laughs> Out of the box. Don't go this stiff, straight way, move. Anyway, so uh, three blind men, see I remembered, three blind men went to see an elephant. Blind men. So one of them touched the the leg of the elephant and declared that an elephant is like a pillar, very hard and huge and rough. And also somebody had warned him that if you go too close, you might find your head crushed under the pillow. Pillar. One definition of the elephant. Fine. The other blind man. That's the tail of the elephant. And said, an elephant is like um, those days there were no bathroom brushes, but he said it's like a long uh, twig which has many bristles in it and it keeps moving. If you go too close, you might get hit by it. Second definition. 
The third definition of the elephant, the third blind man touched the ears of the elephant and said that an elephant is a big flap, rubber-like, which keeps... Oh, there were four blind men, I forgot. Uh, and then the fifth, fourth touched the trunk of the elephant and decided that an elephant is like a rubber hose, big rubber hose which moves and every now and then makes pss, pss noises and this is an elephant and we have been warned, don't go too close, it's your end. Now they started a big fight between the four blind men on what is the correct definition of an elephant. You know how sometimes fights can escalate into fist cuffs. At that stage, a man walked in who was not blind, who could see. And he said, just a minute, what are you guys fighting about? Elephant. So, elephant? Yeah, so this is the definition of an elephant. No, no, this is the... He said, just a minute, I can see, I'm not blind, I can see the elephant. You're right. You're also right. You're also right. You're also right. However, in the absolute sense, you're all wrong. Because an elephant is much more than you can conceive of in this state. Maybe if you were not blind, you could have seen more of the elephant. Now you can see only parts. So therefore, there are different approaches depending upon our limitations. Even to that which has no limitations. Depending on our background, depending on how much we can see, there, are there have been different approaches. Also, on a person's uh, background, mental build-up, and so on. Therefore, since ancient times, the great teachers have said, there are many ways, like the different rivers that flow into the ocean. There are people who have read nothing, who actually haven't even gone to school, who have something called a tender heart and a deep feeling of devotion. Such people have discovered that which we seek merely through devotion. When uh, many people want to take Kriya, so Babaji used to say, look, my, my teacher Babaji, um, it's not necessary that everybody should take Kriya to reach Moksha. And he always used to ask this question, what Kriya did Mirabai practice? Nothing. Nothing. What Kriya did Narsi Mehta practice? Vaishnava Janato Tene Kahir. What did he practice? Nothing. On the other hand, in the other extreme, a great jnani, like Ramana Maharshi, Tiruvannamalai, what Kriya did he practice? Nothing. So it's not that this is the only way, please, because you're going to have Kriya tomorrow. I want to discourage you today as much as possible, so that you don't appear tomorrow. So, there are different ways to approach this problem of finding the treasure which I spoke about. Okay. Let's... Uh, so therefore, Kriya is one of the ways. Mm, yeah. So, as I said, there are different approaches to find the tr truth. Kriya, the meaning of the word Kriya, means a technique. So there are people who, especially in the modern world, who say, oh, you should have some devotion, you will find the truth. I don't have devotion. 
what is this devotion? I can't and okay. Then there are people who say, I can't sit and analyze who I am, what I am. I know who I am. My name is Ritwik Naik or something like that. Huh? What is Kriya then? Kriya is a yogic technique. For those who like to go systematically, step by step, then Kriya is a good way of doing it. Kriya is my tradition, but I don't believe it's the best. Being very frank with you. Well, it is good. The other thing I want to say is that because you have taken to the practice of Kriya, you don't have to change your approach to the Divine. If you consider that divinity can be seen in a form, we have no problem with that. If you think that divinity is abstract and cannot be sensed by the ordinary mind, we have no problem with that. If you think that by singing bhajans and kirtans you can touch the divinity, we have no problem with that. If you think that all this is nonsense, you need to figure out who you are, we have no problem with that. So what will Kriya do? Whichever be the way you follow, Kriya will help you move forward. This is the essence of Kriya. So the word Kriya in Sanskrit means a technique, a practice. It's a step by step, actually is Ashtanga Yoga. It's part of Ashtanga Yoga, but in Ashtanga Yoga there are many Kriyas. In the yoga of Patanjali, there are many Kriyas. Now when I say Kriya, it is that particular Kriya that has been passed on to me from a certain tradition starting with Sri Guru Babaji, Mahishwarnath and me. It's the same tradition that was passed on to Shamacharan Lahiri, Lahiri Mahashaya and then to various other disciples. Although some people have a misunderstanding that Swami Yukteswar Giri was the most important disciple of uh, Lahiri Mahashai. Well, he was, but Panchanan Bhattacharya, a householder yogi who lived in Devgar, which is now in Jharkhand, was the closest and the most important disciple of Lahiri Mahashai. Anyway, that's okay. We need not get into this controversy. What I'm trying to say is it is the same technique with a little modifications here and there, which has been passed down to us. And I have the freedom to modify it as I choose, depending on the person who comes to me. But the central Kriya will remain the same. That doesn't change. So then what is Kriya? There are several Kriyas in the Yoga Shastra. So what is this Kriya? So let me go a little more into a theoretical understanding before we start tomorrow. One of the things about Kriya is that it's not purely Yoga. It falls on the category of Yoga Tantra. Now, one of the best books on Yoga Tantra, written in English and translated, is the Sat Chakra Nirupana, translated by Sir John Udroff into Serpent Power. Beautiful book. Don't practice anything but good for a theoretical understanding of the whole thing. Um, now, in Yoga Tantra, we have an understanding, I was about to say we believe, but it's not belief, it's, it's so. We have an understanding that the human body has uh, channels inside which we call nadis, nadi. Hmm? Now, of these channels through which prana flows, energy flows. Three are very important for our purpose. There is a nadi on the left which is called the ida nadi. Symbolized by the moon, so it's cool. The right side is the pingala, 
symbolized by the sun, which is hot. In fact, in some schools they call it Surya Nadi, Chandra Nadi. Um, now it's interesting that the Ida Nadi actually starts on the right side, crosses at Dajna and goes to the left. And not outside, inside. <laughs> and the, uh, the Pingala starts from here, crosses here and goes in, down on both sides of the spinal cord and meet at the end. Well, if you go into a dissecting room and look at a dead body, you may not see nadis, but you can certainly see the central nervous system and the parasympathetic on both sides, including the vagus nerve. Now, and in many places you will see that from the two sides of the parasympathetic, a cluster of nerves comes and forms a bulb in front, not, not outside the body, inside. They call the plexuses, because the most uh, commonly known one is the solar plexus. Very good defense. If somebody corners you, raise your knee into the solar plexus. For some time, no action. Especially for ladies, good to learn. <laughs> so, these are the Ida and the Pingal. Uh, in yoga, we also call it the Varuna and the Asi. So, the Ajna, where the Varuna and the Asi cross together, for us is Varanasi. Varuna Asi. And here is Shiva sitting in the Sahasrara Chakra, in Kashi. So everybody has a Shiva, everybody is carrying Varanasi with them, whether you go there or not. Okay. Now, for all purposes, including creative purposes, physical purposes, reproduction, digestion, creative writing, painting, music. I, I also believe that particle physics is a creative act. For everything, the prana needs to only act through the ida and the pingala. You no need to act through the... There's one more. I'll come to that. So from here they cross, come on and meet at the bottom. So the meeting point at the bottom is called the Muladhara. Mula means root and Adhara means foundation. So root foundation, Muladhara. Now from the Muladhara there is a central channel going straight up without any bends. And that's in this, near the spine. The central nervous system in the spine goes straight up and that is called the Shushumna. Trida, Pingala, Shushumna. The Shushumna Nadi is, somebody called it the straight and narrow path. It goes straight. And it comes here and meets the Sahasrara from where these two Nadis have come. Now, for all intents and purposes, it's enough if the prana passes through the ida and pingala. It happens everyday life. In fact, the yogis know what activity is best performed when the prana is passing through this nadi or that nadi. That's why the activities are quite perfect, generally. They also know that when old age is approaching, shift the nadi is a bit, man, you need more energy. Mm -hmm. That particular subject is called Kaya Kalpa. We, we won't go into it. Not Kaya Skin Clinic. Kaya. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, um, <laughs> uh, now the central nadi called the Shushumna. If you need to go to higher levels of spiritual understanding, an experience, and finally touch the treasure which is inside us, 
you need to make the prana pass to the shushumna not from these two unfortunately most of our shushumnas are totally closed with muck like many of the drainage systems and sewage systems in our major cities they are all clogged so you get those beautiful smell sometimes when you walk on the street they are clogged and how are they clogged because our emotions anger hatred memories of terrible things that have happened in this life and also in previous lives clogged so if you need to raise the energy and make your mind raise through the central nadi and if the nadi is blocked what is to be done what is the first step you have to clean the nadi if the pipe is not clean then how will you send the water in so therefore the first step of kriya is a technique to clean the shushumna once the shushumna is absolutely clean then you don't have to do much effort in doing anything it happens automatically so the first step is to clean the shushumna once the shushumna is clean then there is a way by which you take the energy up and raise your awareness from the gross to the subtle now i would like to call the uh, left nadi the ida as a cathode and the right as a anode i am deliberately not using the word positive and negative because when you say negative it has a negative connotation it's not that it's that it's a cathode the charge is negative and the anode the charge is positive male female that's why sometimes shiva is called ardhanarishwara Hmm? so when uh, the cathode and the anode are touched what happens is a spark that spark we call the bindu hmm it's sparked off it's called the bindu so the bindu is like a spark like a diamond like a shining diamond you find it when people draw the sri yantra they have a dot in the middle which is called the bindu if you have a three dimensional meru there is a dot at the top which is called the bindu for us yogis it's all inside not outside from the outside you need to turn and come inside finally so the process of cleaning the shushumna is through a certain kind of pranayam after that combined with the pranayam we need to take this bindu slowly up from the shush from the muladhara to the sahasra believe me if suppose a person is a great bhakta or a devotee he doesn't know about bindu he doesn't know about shushumna nothing but in that deep devotion he can break through the conditionings of the mind and the energy automatically travels through the shushumna but here the yogi knowing the technicalities of it is taking it step by step so that your awareness goes from the gross to the subtle to the subtle to the subtle and finally reaches that which is the subtlest which we call shivam and the bindu that goes up is the shakti para shakti raja rajeshwari tripura sundari <laughs> there are many beautiful names um and so on
well, in its destructive aspect, it is the Bhadrakali with the knife in hand. And generally, I tell people avoid. Mm, be careful. Unless you are ready for it. Because there are two things. Even when you draw a Sri Yantra, there is one Yantra called the Samhara Yantra. There is another one called the Srishti Yantra. Samhara is good because it destroys. But when everything is destroyed, what remains is the reality. But everybody is not ready for it. So go through the Srishti. Don't get too much caught up in the other. We like to keep our cars and homes and still have Kriya, no? <laughs> we want to throw, destroy. <laughs> so anyway, um, so there is a gentle way. So the idea of Kriya is to go from the gross, so the awareness rises from the gross to the subtle, to the subtle, because between the Muladhara and the Sasrara there are five centers. Mm. All that we'll explain tomorrow. I'm just giving you a brief of what Kriya should be. So all the exercises that we do in Kriya, I mean, one for cleaning the Sushumna, two for lifting the Bindu from center to center till he reaches the Sasrara, where absorbed in the essence of one's being, which is Shivam, Adi Shankaracharya and the Nirvana Shatakam said, Chidananda Rupam, Shivam, Shivam. So that Shivam is there in all of us. That Shakti is also there in all of us. We need to tap and figure out how to activate. This is the practice of Kriya Yoga. So now you see, you may be uh, following a certain way of life and worship. You don't have to change anything. When you practice Kriya, you will find that the way which you follow becomes clearer for you. The movement becomes clearer. From the grass, you then go to the subtle. The, the Ishta that you have been worshipping becomes part of your inner being, Antaryami. And then, then you are happy under all circumstances. So tomorrow, after the Kriya, when we have the Satsang, I am going to do a bit of the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is Dhyana Yoga, the Yoga of Meditation, and then connect it, and then you will see when you have taken Kriya, how it is connected to it. In fact, I think historically the first reference to Kriya in a little mm, mm, covered form, not so openly, comes in the Bhagavad Gita. The sixth chapter, Dhyana Yoga, Krishna says to Arjuna, if you want to be free, to attain moksha, sit in a comfortable posture, fix your attention in the Brumadhyaya, balance your prana and apana and be free. That much is said. Details, of course, are not given. Maybe he taught him later after the battle. Who knows? <laughs> so this is Kriya Yoga. So what is our time limit? Some people, everybody knows meditation. Okay, so <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Today <clears throat> we have half an hour of meditation and tomorrow the Kriya, okay? The people who have already taken Kriya from me many years ago and who diligently don't practice can also attend the Kriya session. Uh, so that they get a little bit of a review. <laughs> So the time reserved for the review, we can do satsang. Hmm? Yeah. There are very nice, good people who have taken Kriya but don't practice what to do. So, 
Um, okay, now the meditation that we're going to do. If you are already accustomed to some form of meditation, you can do that. Because it will be silent meditation. I am not going to guide you step by step. However, if um, you haven't and you want to do something new, it's, this is not new. What I am going to tell you is not new. There is nothing new. Just like Jesus said, it's all old wine in new bottles. Mm. So what you need to do is close your eyes. Not now. No. <laughs> close your eyes and watch your breath. If you are practicing Vipassana, then I don't have to tell you. Just watch your breath. As you see, normally we never watch our breath. It's such an important part of our life. It's the most important part of our uh, nutrition. Without breath you cannot have oxygen. Nothing will happen in the system. From the child in the womb till the day we die, it goes on by itself. The lungs keep moving. You don't say breathe, right? It goes on. And when it stops, if you say breathe, there's no use. You are not there to say breathe. It's gone. It's such an important part of your life. And yet, look, you can live without food for some time. Gandhiji lived for many days without food. You cannot, you can live without water for some time also. You cannot live without breath for even a minute or a half. It's so important. <clears throat> and we don't give any attention to our breath. First of all, we don't even know how to breathe. We think, this is breath. So, one way of meditation is to close your eyes, watch your breath, give complete attention for once to your breath. It's a valuable thing. Cultivate a friendship with the breath. And if you cultivate a friendship with your breath, you will reach the essence from where the breath has come. You know the old story of how in the, in the Old Testament, God creates a human being out of clay. Let's not get into that controversy anyway. And then what happens? Then he breathes the breath of life into him. So breath is a connection between the divine and the physical. Without that breath there is nothing. So close your eyes and take a deep, quiet, slow breath without effort, without much effort and watch it. The most important thing is to watch as you breathe in. And then you may hold for half a second or you need not. Breathe out and as you breathe out, slowly. Don't do, <laughs> this is not Bastrika. Very slowly breathe in. Give complete attention to the breath. In fact, consider it a sacred thing. Watch your breath. And then when you exhale, give complete attention to the exhalation, as slow as possible. Continue to do that for 5-10 minutes, then just don't even give attention to the breath, just sit quietly. It would be nice if you tap your forehead a few times and fix your attention there. Just relax. Then you are not controlling your breath, but simply watching your breath, whichever way or whatever rhythm it takes, don't interfere. Just watch it come in and watch it go out. After some time you'll get, you'll feel, I don't even want to do that, I just want to sit quiet, sit quiet. And then just before you are going to fall asleep, I'll clap, then we can get. Yeah. You want to use your hands, 
Well, you can keep your hands like this, or you can keep your hands like this, or you can keep your hands like this, or you can keep your hands like this. As long as you don't keep your hands like this, you're fine. Now, before this, I'm going to chant Om three times. You have to chant with me. Three Oms together, and then we sit and do what we wanted to do. Hmm? And don't worry, I'll definitely alert you and wake you up. Hmm. Start, Om. Oh. Om. 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 